Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to our afternoon webinar on COVID-19 vaccinations, scientific and ethical issues. I'm Dr. Tammy Tobin. I'm joined today by Dr. Peggy Peeler and Dr. Antonio Rockwell. And Dr. Carlos Ayutica also helped prepare all the information we're talking about today, but is unable to be with us today. Today, what we hope to do is give you a little bit of background on how the COVID-19 vaccines work, then take you through the vaccine approval process before talking about the current distribution of the vaccine and ways in which we might think about making that more equitable, and finally, overcoming vaccination hesitancy. Um, ultimately, we're hoping to give you enough information that you will be less hesitant to take the vaccines yourself when it is finally your turn, that's our hope, and that you will understand um, why it's important to sort of stay in your place in line in the vaccine distribution. All right, so I'm gonna start out by talking about the COVID-19 vaccines that are currently available and how they work. So I wanna start out with just a brief biology of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. This is the virus that causes COVID-19. You can see it's a fairly simple little particle. Um, it consists of this inner curly part here is its genetic material. And this is single-stranded RNA. It's called messenger RNA. And this is the molecule that can be converted directly into proteins, as we'll see in a little while. So it has a messenger RNA genome. It is surrounded by a lipid membrane. This is made of fats. And that lipid membrane then is studded with virus proteins that are necessary for the virus structure and for it to be able to replicate. The most important protein that we're gonna be looking at today for today's purposes is this spike glycoprotein here. This is the protein that the virus needs in order to bind to our cells. So getting to that then, just to give you a very brief overview of how viruses um, infect us and then make more copies that can then cause disease. Every virus needs to get into us somehow, and then they bind specifically to our cells. And again, this is done with the spike glycoprotein. The virus then enters our cells, makes lots of copies of itself, and then those copies exit the cell, generally killing the cell and causing a lot of the disease symptoms that we see. So without this spike glycoprotein, um, the virus is not going to be able to attach to our cells. Okay, what I wanna do next then is talk in general about how vaccines work, and then we'll move specifically to how the COVID-19 vaccines work. So in a vaccine, scientists take some part of a virus or a weakened full virus, and they inject that into a patient. When that part enters the patient, that is able to be recognized by our immune systems. And the immune systems then will try to fight that, that um, part or that incomplete virus off. In the process, if vaccines work very well, this immune response also generates what are called fast acting memory cells. And that means that the next time we see um, that virus part, and this time it would be if we actually came in contact with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, we would be able to mount a very fast, very efficient immune response so that we wouldn't get sick. So again, the idea is, is we use a part of a virus that can't make us sick to stimulate a very fast immune response that will keep us from getting sick the next time we encounter the virus. So how do the specific vaccines that we're using in the US and worldwide now work? The first one and the one that's being used, the ones that are being used in the US today are the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. And these are messenger RNA vaccines. So if you remember, here's our virus friend again, and it has a messenger RNA genome. A very teeny portion of that, it's shown here in red um, with the arrow pointing to it, is the gene for the spike glycoprotein. That part of the messenger RNA is then stuck inside something called a lipid nanoparticle, which basically just has a bunch of fat surrounding the messenger RNA. 
When that is used as a vaccine then, this lipid particle is able to actually fuse with, bind to and fuse with our own cells. The messenger RNA gets released into our cells and then our cells convert that into a protein. In this case, it's the spike glycoprotein. That spike glycoprotein can then be responded to by our immune system, causing a protective response. The other vaccine that's out there being, the other type of vaccine, I should say, that's out there in late clinical trials, and in some cases, um, at already approved in some places, are things called adenovirus vector vaccines. Um, these are the types of vaccines that are made by Oxford AstraZeneca, by Johnson & Johnson, and the Russian Sputnik vaccine. In this case, if we look over here to my figure on the right, adenoviruses are a different kind of virus. They actually cause the common cold in humans. And what scientists do is they alter that adenovirus so it can no longer cause disease. So it can still bind to and get taken in by cells, but it can no longer cause the common cold. They also insert one gene from COVID-19 into this adenovirus, and that is the gene for the spike glycoprotein. That then uh, goes into the cell. It gets expressed as messenger RNA. And just like we saw when we directed or injected the messenger RNA directly, that messenger RNA gets converted into protein and that spike glycoprotein can stimulate our immune system to make a response. All right, on to Dr. Peeler. Great, thank you, Tammy. All right, so I'm gonna be talking about the vaccine approval process, both in the United States and then talking about how it's going globally. So go ahead and hit the next slide, please, Tammy. Oh, that didn't work. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Okay. So um, some of the hesitancy about the current vaccines is that some people are concerned that somehow they have evaded or skipped over steps of the approval process, which is not true. Um, we want to go back one there. Um, so just a quick overview of the types of trials that um, are conducted um, to before a vaccine gets approved. The companies that make these and the medical centers that are exploring them, really true is any of any drug in addition to vaccines, they do a lot of what are called preclinical testing. They're testing them on cells grown in the laboratory. They're giving them to animal models to see what kind of immune response is produced. And then once they have sufficient data that they think this is gonna be an effective drug or a vaccine, um, what they do is they move on to testing it in humans. And the first type of test is a phase one trial, and it's really just a safety trial. You give it to a limited number of people to make sure that there aren't any unanticipated side effects or safety concerns. You try to figure out what the right dosage would be. And with a vaccine, you are specifically looking to figure out what dosage is going to stimulate the immune system using the mechanisms that Dr. Tobin just talked about. Um, when that seems to work, you can then move on to a phase two expanded trial where you go from a very small number to maybe hundreds of people. And you try at this point to incorporate different groups of people, children, the elderly, just to make sure that the vaccine is gonna give you the same type of immune response um, in all of them. This, these particular vaccines, most of them have not been tested very well yet in children. And so you'll see the recommendations a lot of times are for you know people 16 and older or 18 and older. Um, and that's actually not such a bad thing since we think that COVID um, is much less severe when children do experience it. So they're not necessarily gonna be left at risk until we know that it's safe to give them the vaccine. And then if they get good data from phase two, you move on to the phase three. This is really the efficacy trial where you give it to thousands of people. Both Moderna and Pfizer use somewhere between 40 and 60,000 individuals. And what you do is you split them into two groups and half of them get the actual vaccine and half of them get an injection um, of a placebo. And then this is a little different from other trials. You're not going to then most places yet are not intending to deliberately expose people to the virus to see if they get infected. But, you know, I guess the fortunate side of having so much community spread of the virus right now is that over time, people, if they're not protected, are going to become infected. And when you hit a certain level of infection, you simply compare the people who got the actual vaccine with people who got a placebo infection. And that, that determines what is called the efficacy rate. We'll look at that in a minute, some of the data that we see. 
All right, the next slide just shows us what happens after that. The companies then present their, um, their data to the um, regulatory agencies, and in this country it's the Food and Drug Administration. And that can allow you to then, if you don't have all the data you might eventually have, but things look pretty good, you can have early or emergency or limited approval. And that's primarily what most of these vaccines have at this point. And eventually, as we get more and more data on their effectiveness and safety, they'll move on to full approval. Several vaccines have um, gone into widespread use, um, particularly the ones from China and Russia, without fully completing the phase three trials. And at this moment, we don't necessarily have a lot of reason to be concerned about that, but that is a, a, a place where there might be the opportunity for more serious risks just because we haven't gotten all the data. Okay, the next slide then shows um, some information about where we are. This is globally. This is something that the New York Times does. They have a wonderful website. Um, most of the major newspapers do, but this is from the New York Times that you can look at the number of vaccines under development to date, divided by phase one, phase two, phase three, um, and you can see that there are lots of vaccines still in those phases of testing and development. Eight vaccines have been given limited approval. Two have been approved. None have full approval yet in the United States, but there are some countries that have fully approved some. And then there are companies that are abandoning some because they, in somewhere along the way, typically have not proven to be uh, as effective as you would like. Merck actually just within the last week or so um, has abandoned two that um, they had hoped would be promising. The good news here, especially as we hear about new variants coming, um, mutating in the virus and so forth, the more different types of vaccines we have in the pipeline, probably the better the arsenal will be in the long run in terms of getting us finally to global herd immunity. Um, the next slide, please. Um, let's go to the to the next next one because um, it's pretty similar. That was the Pfizer data. This is the Moderna data. This is what the FDA would have looked at to see how effective these are. So the purple line, um, as you can see, going up um, the x-axis, the bottom axis is the days since the trial started, and the y-axis is the incidence rate. How many people in that population are um, experiencing COVID? And it's cumulative. So overall, you see the number of people with COVID, symptomatic COVID is going up. The orange line is the group, um, a large group that was given the actual vaccine. And what you can see is that the level of COVID people developing COVID symptoms is much, much, much lower. So when you hear that it has a, let's say 90 or 95% effectiveness rate, what that means of all the people in the trial in both groups that develop COVID symptoms, 95% of them came in the placebo group. So it doesn't mean you're perfectly protected by the vaccine, but you have a much lower chance of having symptomatic COVID. And then the table on the bottom is maybe equally important. There were 11 people that got the vaccine who still developed symptomatic COVID, but none of them went on to develop severe COVID disease. Whereas 185 people actually developed symptoms in the placebo group and 30 actually progressed to have um, severe COVID. So the good news is the vaccine may not be completely protective. It says 94.1% efficacy, but even if you get COVID, you're much like, less likely to get severe disease if you've been vaccinated. So that's the Moderna data that the FDA looked at to give um, that emergency or early approval. So the next topic we wanna to talk about is um, where are the vaccines going? And we need to get them everywhere in order to achieve herd immunity globally. So that's what we're gonna be looking at next. So next slide, please. This is a list of what um, the New York Times at least deems to be the leading vaccines. And what I wanna point out here is um, they're coming from lots of different types of pharmaceutical companies and um, medical centers and different governmental entities really all over the world. So the flags there show you the countries of origin. Um, so there was uh, US input into both Pfizer and Moderna. The third one down is the Russian vaccine. Um, and then we see the AstraZeneca, the one from China, the Johnson & Johnson one that we're all hoping is going to move to FDA approval um, relatively soon. The, you also see a column there that shows you that the first two are the mRNA viruses, and then we have a couple adenovirus ones, um, and then some that have different mechanisms of action, um, the actual spike protein or the an inactivated virus. So lots of good things in the pipeline. Um, not all of them are very far along, but lots of them are in phase three trial right now. So the next slide tells us a little bit about um, where they've been approved. This is the, the Russian vaccine, which they have named Sputnik V. 
those of you that are my age or so will appreciate why in a global competition for a scientific endeavor, the Russians might have chosen to call their vaccine Sputnik. Um, and you can see it's a relatively limited, all conditional approval at this point. Um, I wanna point out that Argentina is one of the places where this has been approved. So um, for you, so Tammy, the next slide. Um, this, is, this is because our colleague Carlos um, Utica actually was in Argentina last year for sabbatical and remains there unable to travel back to the US because of the pandemic. Um, so we're kind of focusing on what's happening with the virus and the vaccine in Argentina. Um, and they have taken a bit of a shot, long shot with um, Russia's Sputnik vaccine in terms of not knowing as much about the data for its efficacy. Um, but Argentina is one of those countries in the world with somewhat limited resources and they've kind of dumped them into um, hoping that this vaccine is going to be um, effective for their population. All right, the next slide I think shows the Pfizer approval. And you can see there are a few places that have given full approval, but US, Canada, um, Southern American countries, Australia, still in the early or limited or emergency use approval, but it's um, becoming more widespread. Next slide. All right, so now we can look at how many people in various countries are actually getting vaccinated and we see there's a huge variation from country to country. The top bar on this chart shows you the percentage of the population. This is doses per 100 people. So it's probably single doses at this point, but some may include some people who have gotten two doses. Israel is shown at the top bar. Tammy, can you maybe sort of use your cursor and show that data where Israel is? Um, and that number 49.3 out of 100, that's close to 50% um, of their population has gotten at least the single dose. The next country down is the United Arab Emirates and then the UK and then Bahrain and then United States, according to this chart is fifth. So we are a little frustrated that we are not doing as well with our rollout. Um, we have you know, hit about maybe seven, six to 7% 7 of our population. So we're not doing as well as some other countries but we're doing better than a lot of countries that are there as well. The bottom countries are India and Mexico. So, so why such variation? Um, and there are two reasons, at least two reasons. So the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about um, whether the people in a particular country are gonna be willing to be vaccinated, which is gonna affect obviously how much, um, how close they can get to herd immunity, how quickly. The dark green and the light green on these bars indicate people who either strongly or somewhat agreed with the statement, if a vaccine for COVID-19 were available, I would get it. The orange and the red are the opposite, people who disagreed or strongly disagreed with um, their agree uh, wanting to have the vaccine if it were available. So the top country there, 80% with agree or strongly agree is China. So you can see a, a large portion of their population is willing to get it, but it's not universal, even in the countries where, that have the highest or the least hesitant hesitancy. Um, and then there's some kind of variation as you go across the, the spectrum of different countries. Um, the US is right in the middle. At this point, 69% of our population are in the agree or strongly disagree. So about two thirds, not enough to get us to herd immunity by most estimations. So we have some work to do to convince people that it's safe to get these vaccines. And then there's some real surprises, the very bottom that you see is, is more orange and red than it is green at all. That's France, where only 40% of their population in this survey at least said that they would be willing to take the vaccine. And so there's lots of country to country variation in global acceptance of the vaccine. So that's one reason, but probably a more important reason is just vaccine availability. So if we look at the next slide, um, it's limited, it's a limited resource and different countries have um, very different resources in terms of their access to be able to get the limited supply that's out there. And not surprisingly, countries um, who don't have the resources of some of the more wealthy countries are um, facing much longer waits. So for example, Africa is a continent, most of the countries there, even though there is, um, for example, in South Africa, significant work on vaccine development, most of those countries are gonna not be at the front of the line in terms of vaccine availability. Um, India has a huge population. They're just starting what hopes to be a very large vaccination campaign, but again, limited resources in terms of availability. Um, the next slide shows some additional um, issues with this accessibility problem. Um, within the last week or maybe two weeks, the World Health Organization chief actually called this a catastrophic moral failure 
of richer countries buying up and dominating the vaccine supplies, which may make sense. You know, you might want to do your own country, your own citizens first, but we're a global um, society now. People travel until we end the pandemic everywhere. It will not end anywhere. So that's that's one issue that we'll look at in a in a bit more detail. Um, and the other is even in a country like Israel, where they're doing well in terms of overall percentage of population, in fact, leading the world, the availability of the vaccine to everyone there is not the same. So, for example, um, Palestinians are not included. Israel's done a good job with their most vulnerable people, 75% of citizens over the age of 60, and that does include Palestinians who are citizens of Israel or live in the occupied areas of East Jerusalem, but it does not include any of the 4.5 million Palestinians who are living in the West Bank or Gaza. So that's an ethical issue of concern. And then in terms of um, rich countries buying up all of the resources, this is an interesting graph. This shows you um, sort of where countries bet, you know, where did they put their bets on these vaccines? These are the vaccine pre-orders as a percentage of population. And maybe somewhat surprisingly, the US is not the biggest hog of the vaccine pre-orders. Canada um, has agreed to buy enough vaccine for over 500% of their population, which may sound crazy until you realize that not every vaccine that they've invested in is likely to become successful in going all the way to, um, you know, to clinical use in, in their country. The US at this point has um, pre-ordered about um, enough for 200% of our population. We, and you may have seen this week, we have just extended that. We're gonna buy a couple hundred more million doses from Pfizer and Moderna. So we're expanding that. Um, down at the bottom of this list, and these are all considered to be high income countries, South Korea is at the bottom of the list. They have not quite hit 100%, but they've significantly pre-ordered. The next bar chart shows you what you would consider to be lower to middle income countries. And most of them you know, don't have the resources to compete with the big richer countries. Um, you see Moldova and Bangladesh and El Salvador and Egypt um, that have you know, barely enough to get started on achieving herd immunity. All right, next slide, I think transitions to Dr. Rockwell's portion. All right, I'm gonna discuss vaccine distribution in the United States. As Dr. Pillar mentioned, in order for us to get past this pandemic, we need to achieve herd immunity and the most responsible way is through vaccinations, which was realized early on by the federal government. Therefore, they, de they developed what is known as Operation Warp Speed. Operation Warp Speed was a collaborative effort between the White House, the Department of Defense, and the Department of Human and Health Services with the goal to produce and distribute large amounts of vaccine by the end of 2020. And the two vaccines that have been distributed in the United States today come from Pfizer and Moderna, as was previously touched on. While, the, while Operation Warp Speed succeeded in producing the pair of working vaccines, of where it has failed is in the actual distribution process. Vaccine distribution is based on a set of government guidelines established by the CDC and specifically the ACIP committee, which I'll touch on in the next slide, in order to ensure equitable distribution throughout the country. Now, could you go to the next slide, please? So, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, which is part of the CDC, has a set of ethical principles that need to be followed, that should be followed when supply is limited. Because although we have ordered a large amount of supply, we currently do not actually have that supply already readily available at this very moment. So the ethical principles that should be followed is to ensure that we are promoting public health and distributing the vaccine and preventing death and illness as much as possible, uh, mitigating in inequities, making sure that everyone has access to the COVID vaccine and getting rid of those avoidable bar barriers to vaccination. And of course, promoting transparency, making this process clear. Now, could you go to the next slide, please? So on December 1st, the CDC, CDC put out its first set of guidelines to start distributing the vaccine in phases, starting with phase 1A, in which healthcare personnel and long-term care facility residents should be offered the COVID vaccination first. And could you go to the next slide? The guidelines have since been updated. On December 20th, uh, the 
it was outlined for phase additional phases phase 1b and 1c and which phase b 1b recommends that people who are 75 and older and non-healthcare frontline essential workers should receive the vaccine and in phase 1c people who are 65 to 74 years of age and people who are 16 to 64 with comorbidities uh, should receive the vaccine. And it's important to note essential workers were not included in phase 1B. And could you go to the next slide? Now, a lot of the issues that have arisen uh, that related to vaccine distribution is due to conflict between federal and state governments. Uh, the previous federal government gave states autonomy in dealing with the COVID crisis, uh, which include, includes the vaccine distribution process, which prevented a cohesive plan from being put in place to uh, equitably distribute the vaccine throughout the population. Now, the delivery system for Pfizer and Moderna are slightly different, but the overall process is the same in which state governments were to order doses based on need. However, uh, the previous federal government were not were, were actually not able to to meet the the requirements uh, based on the the supply as the supply was overestimated. Additionally, you do have issues occurring at the state levels in which states are mismanaging the distribution process. Could you go to the next slide? Now, here are examples of states that are uh, fairly culturally different, Florida, Pennsylvania, and New York. And just to give you a little uh, background on each of these states, phase 1A, and also a little bit of background on New York's phase 1B, as New York has entered phase 1B as of January 11th. So for Florida, Pennsylvania, and New York, uh, people in long care facilities were all to receive the vaccine first. Uh, same for individuals who are 65 and up and individuals with significant comorbidities were to receive the vaccine during phase 1A, where the, their strategies differ a little bit. Florida required or recommended that high risk frontline healthcare workers receive the vaccine, while Pennsylvania and New York's had a bit more broad take on healthcare workers that could receive the vaccine. And Florida early on did not allow essential workers or essential workers were more of a lower priority. Uh, in Pennsylvania, workers not directly involved in patient care, but has a, had a high chance of contracting COVID, were able to get the vaccine. And New York's phase 1B, you had more healthcare workers, law enforcement officials, and individuals within education, uh, teachers, public transit workers that were able to receive the vaccine. Uh, could you go to the next slide? So issues at the state level involved in uh, related to the, the distribution issues that have occurred. Uh, I mentioned the, the supply shortages, which uh, the supply shortages were due to the federal government not meeting those, those requirements, because you did also have issues with registration in which people went online to register for vaccine. And when they showed up to their employment, or appointment, uh, they were unable to, to be vaccinated. You have misinformation, uh, which leads to people thinking that are vaccines that are present that are not. I'll give an example from New York City uh, last week in which a group of about 600 individuals in Brooklyn showed up to a vaccine uh, center. However, they were told that they could not receive the vaccine as there were no more left. And then you have issues between state and local governments in which governors and mayors are putting blame or putting blame on each other for uh, the failures within, within their state systems. Can you go to the next slide? So this is an example of where we are at as far as vaccine distribution as of January 26, which is this past Tuesday. And really just focus, I would like you to focus on just a few states here in New York, Pennsylvania, and Florida. And we can compare those to states with significantly less population, such as Oklahoma, the Dakotas, and West Virginia. You can see that they have a higher percentage of their population vaccinated. But you can also, on the other hand, see the states with less population that have less of their, their population vaccinated, such as Kansas, uh, Missouri, and Illinois. So the vaccination uh, throughout the states really come down to 
each individual state's mandates and, hor and as it pertains to who actually gets the, the vaccination. Right, could you go to the next slide? Additionally, uh, with the, the issues that I previously mentioned, there were unforeseen issues that have arisen that has affected distribution. You have affluent individuals which are trying to essentially cut the line in order to try to receive a vaccine first. You have individuals who work in medical facilities that are getting the vaccine, although they are not a part of the, the given phase. You have individuals who are just going around to pharmacies and just registering online to try to uh, get a vaccine before the phase that they are a part of is actually uh, actually uh, in play. And then you have an issue where thousands of vaccines have been tossed in the garbage. And a lot of this is due to equipment failures and delivery failures as the vaccine has to be kept at a certain temperature for it to still be viable. Uh, but there's the issue in which vaccines uh, are, are essentially uh, going to waste due to those issues. And uh, an interesting take on, on, uh, on those issues, on that story, is that a lot of it's being underreported for fear of retribution. Could you go to the next slide? Now, uh, as I was mentioning earlier with the, the guidelines for equitable distribution, uh, one of the things to take into account is uh, to focus on individuals, groups that are being disproportionately impacted to ensure equitable distribution. So throughout this pandemic, you do have uh, several demographic groups that have been affected at higher rates. For example, Black individuals have a 2.6 higher case rate, uh, a hospitalization rate that is 4.7 times higher, and a death rate that is 2.1 times higher than non-Hispanic white populations. Hispanic Latinx individuals, similarly to what we see in Black community, you have a case rate that's 2.8 times higher, a hospitalization rate that's 4.7 times higher, and a death rate that's 1. times higher. And we see this that same trend in American Indian and Alaskan Native individuals and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders. And as many of us has heard, have heard to this point, individuals who are older, 65 and up and 85 and older have significantly been impacted by this by this pandemic as well. Now, in order to you can go to the next slide to ensure equitable distribution for groups that are being disproportionately impacted, the committee uh, has a set of guidelines, a framework for equitable allocation, such as the very first being uh, follow the committee's framework. Uh, take advantage or leverage existing systems in order to uh, equally distribute the, the vaccine, provide and administer the COVID vaccine without cost, as cost is a major barrier, barrier uh, not necessarily just for COVID-19 vaccine, but just for medical care in general uh, in the United States. You want to make sure that you create a COVID-19 vaccine risk communication and engagement program to really inform individuals uh, within different communities, develop and launch a COVID-19 vaccine promotional campaign to actually uh, inform individuals of information, uh, credible information related to the vaccine and use and develop those promotional campaigns based on data evidence that already exists. And lastly, support equitable allocation of COVID-19 uh, vaccine globally, because as Dr. Pillar mentioned, we can only end this pandemic uh, if we end it globally, as we are part of the global community. Go to the next slide. Then uh, Dr. Tobin will uh, get us started on why individuals are hesitant. Okay, I saw a question online here, and hopefully some of this will, will answer some of your questions. So one of the things that we're going to be struggling with is not only our ability to get vaccines to the people who should have them and the people that need them, but also to get the people who should have them and who need them um, to actually agree to get the vaccine. The first reason that uh, many people are hesitant to get the vaccine had to do with myths and conspiracy theories, uh, many of these online, but also spread person to person. I've listed um, 
most of the most popular ones. Um, everything that I've listed there is not true, uh, but I only really have time today to go over some of them. So I've, I've picked a few of the big ones and those are in blue. Um, if anybody has any further questions about any myths they hear about these vaccines or conspiracies and they want me to elaborate more, um, just contact me. We'll have contact information at the end and I'll be happy to give you more information. So the first is, can the vaccine give you COVID-19? And the answer is no. The vaccines that are currently being used and being looked at in the, for use in the United States actually don't contain the entire coronavirus. So as you saw, Moderna and Pfizer only contain a little part, and the, and the AstraZeneca as well, only contain a little part of the entire virus's genome. So they don't have anything else that the virus needs to make itself and to cause disease. So it's impossible for just this one gene to give you COVID-19. Some people are worried that injecting this messenger RNA will change their DNA. Again, this is not possible in our cells. So the way that our cells work is we have DNA as our genetic material, and that DNA is changed by enzymes into messenger RNA that are then used to code for proteins. So we have enzymes that will make messenger RNA out of DNA. We don't have any enzymes in our cells that do the opposite reaction. So there's no way that this messenger RNA can get into our DNA. In fact, messenger RNA by its nature is very unstable in our cells once it gets in there. So it gets broken down very quickly. So the virus pretty much gets gets uh, broken down in, or the vaccine, I should say, gets broken down and disappears very quickly um, after the vaccination. Um, women who are uh, trying to get pregnant, who are pregnant and are breastfeeding also have significant concerns about the COVID-19 vaccines. Um, and, the take, and this is because there wasn't a lot of early data on those populations. The take home message is that those women should still get vaccinated. In particular, one of the myths that's going around is that the protein can cause or in the vaccine can cause female infertility. This is um, a myth uh, that's been spread by two doctors who are up to their eyeballs in lots of different myths and conspiracy theories online. Um, this has no truth to it whatsoever. When you look at the protein sequence of the spike glycoprotein and any of the proteins in the placenta, there's no s significant similarity whatsoever. In fact, um, women who have gotten COVID-19, have recovered from COVID-19, um, have gotten pregnant and had normal pregnancies thus far. And that would not be true if any of the proteins in the spike protein prevented that. And women who became pregnant while they were in the COVID-19 trials uh, all, or the, the vaccine trials also are having normal pregnancies. So there's, there's no problem with fertility and these vaccines. And then finally, and this gets at, at, at our question earlier in, in the um, online Q&A, is a lot of people are really worried about it because they don't trust the process. It feels like it's too fast. It is very true that this vaccine approval process is much faster than what we've seen before. But this isn't because it was rushed. It's first of all, because um, COVID-19, the virus that causes it is a coronavirus. And there are hundreds of other coronaviruses out there that have been very well studied by scientists. In fact, we were well along the way to make vaccines for the original SARS virus when we discovered how it was spread by um, civet cats and just stopped interacting with civet cats. So the vaccine became unnecessary. So we already had a lot of the groundwork done because of that viral outbreak. The other thing is, is as soon as this pandemic started, scientists began sharing their data openly worldwide. And we, we really never do that. And so the second one lab made a really important breakthrough, another lab could use that data instead of having to wait months or years for publication before having access. And the last, of course, is Operation Warp Speed that um, allowed the companies to have enough money, seed money, to start doing production um, while they were waiting for federal approval, and also that moved these vaccines up to the front line of the approval process rather than having to wait their turn. Um, and so I think 
one of the best arguments against thinking that this process, the approval process was too rushed, was to realize that despite significant political pressure to get this approval done prior to the election, neither the companies involved in making the viruses nor the FDA sort of buckled under pressure and rushed that approval process. So um, it was really fast and that's a good thing in this case. So within uh, black communities, communities of color, you do have a lot of distrust in medical establishments, which leads to individuals being hesitant and re receiving the, the vaccine. And that's due to a legacy of systemic racism within medicine and abuses of power of medical professionals and researchers. For example, one of the most well-documented early cases of an abuse of power by a medical professional was Dr. Sims, the father of modern gynecology, in which in the 1840s, Dr. Sims operated on slave women to perfect a fistula surgery, which is caused by a birth complication. And even though Anesthesia was shown to be effective shortly after Dr. Sims started his experiments. He decided not to use anesthesia because of the common belief at the time that Black people did not feel pain and anxiety. And for Dr. Sims' work, uh, several states erected statues of, of him. Fast forward of almost a century later, you have the Tuskegee experiments in which a group of researchers wanted to see how syphilis progressed within the African-American community. Therefore, they left syphilis untreated for a period of 40 years. Uh, syphilis causes debilitating, debilitating con conditions if left untreated, uh, which a lot of these individuals suffer greatly from. And you often hear that the individuals say that these are in the past, uh, we're in 2021, how does that impact us today? So these unconscious and conscious biases that have existed throughout the history still impact populations, people of uh, color uh, to this very day. Uh, for example, I have a statistic, a statistic shown in this graphic here in which for Black women are four times likely or more likely to die during childbirth as compared to white women. And even just a, an example from my personal life, my wife gave birth this past August and we decided to drive three and a half hours of every, uh, for every medical appointment to ensure that we had a physician that uh, did not have conscious or unconscious biases that uh, would uh, that would uh, jeopardize uh, the pregnancy. And going off that, uh, how it pertains to COVID, as I previously mentioned, you do have individuals, people of color, Black, Hispanic, Latin, X, of uh, Native, uh, Native, uh, Native Americans, and uh, so on and so forth that have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19. Uh, so in asking when you have an issue, a situation in which medical professionals and researchers are asking uh, individuals in these communities to trust the process, uh, it's very difficult because over the course of American history, that trust has simply not been earned, which leads to why people are hesitant. And go to the, the next slide. Uh, I think we'll we'll take questions now. Yep, I'm going to unmute myself here. Um, okay, I think we talked about anonymous attendee. The first, I'm at the very top here about how much vaccine skepticism is due to fear of a rushed process versus a result of the active spread of anti-scientific disinformation. Um, both are powerful drivers of this, and so. Um, it's important to counter anti-scientific disinformation with fact and then um, just to spread the reason for the, the fast, uh, the, the speed uh, was actually a scientific process working really well. Uh, my pointer's not working. 
Uh, there's another question I was thinking is uh, how it was said that if viruses do not have the spike protein to stick to us, that they will not stick. Does COVID-2 virus have that specific protein? Yes, um, it does have that spike like a protein. And since it's mutating quickly, will there be a vaccine that also muta mutates along with it? That's, um, that's a great question. Um, thus far, we're fortunate that the mutations in that spike glycoprotein seem to still, the vaccines seem to still work on that, but it is quite possible that at some point later on, um, the virus will mutate enough that the current vaccines don't work and new ones have to be developed. Um, that, by the way, is a plug for getting vaccinated as soon as you can. These new variants only come about by mutating the old ones, and if we control the old ones, the new ones won't mutate as quickly. Um, it's also sort of a sign of hope. These messenger RNA vaccines can be altered and new ones can be made very quickly. Um, so we, we should be able to keep on top of these new variants if they become less susceptible to old vaccines. Um, and I'd like to just add, you know, apart from the obviously horrific human tragedy that this pandemic has been, it has raised so many interesting scientific questions about coronavirus and how they infect us. And um, we know a lot about, you know, there's a receptor on cells. Why do some people seem to get so sick? I mean, they could have an infection and not feel sick from it. They can um, be exposed and not necessarily even have a positive test. So there's a lot of just that basic biology about the interaction between the virus and the spike protein and its receptor and how our own genetic variation influences that that we have yet to answer. This is gonna keep people in public health and epidemiology and other fields of science um, in work for a very long time to try to figure out a lot of this, this basic science. But it is amazing, I'll agree with Dr. Tobin that we have come so far so fast. And a lot of that is because there was so much previous work before anybody had ever heard of a coronavirus, there were people who were working on them. Uh, do you think there is a very high possibility to get sick as if you had COVID, just like how some people get sick from the flu shot. If so, do you think that it will be likely to get past it? Okay, so I, I think the idea behind this question, I've seen a few questions like that earlier as well, is um, the is the virus, is the vaccine um, likely to make you very sick? There's um, very occasionally, we've seen in the news, uh, very rarely, um, there are, um, allergic reactions to these shots are very rare. And when you get a vaccine uh, and nobody's, nobody's died from them, so that's all been good. But um, when you get the vaccine, you're asked to stay in the doctor's office for a time afterwards to make sure you're not having one of those reactions. So that's, they, and they can deal with that very easily. The other um, symptoms that you get, like when you get a flu shot from a vaccine are simply your immune system doing what it's supposed to be doing. And so, and some people actually do get something else at the same time um, that they get a flu shot and blame the flu shot for it. So um, neither of these vaccines actually cause the disease and, and none of the sore arms or anything like that that you would get from a COVID shot would be anywhere as near as horrific as ending up in the hospital on a ventilator. So those, um, those side effects are, are really not. Um, um, and, uh, and some people have been asking in the questions about, you know, longer mm -hmm. term, we've had a lot of vaccines that work the exact same way in terms of how our immune system responds to those. Once the, once the stuff is in you, your immune system reacts to it in a very predictable way. And with all of those things, even when there are adverse reactions, they are not long-term consequences. They will appear relatively quickly after, after the vaccination. So I don't think we need to be so worried that we have to study them for 10 years to sort of know what those long-term consequences are going to be. Um, and I am looking at um, my time. We were supposed to end at two and we're a little bit past two. There's a oh, lot of great okay. questions still in the chat. Our emails are up there and we'd be very happy to communicate with anybody, student or outside the, the Susquehanna community if you have additional questions and we'll see if we can find you the information that you're looking for. So thanks so much to all of you for participating and have a great day and stay safe. Yep, thanks and get vaccinated early and often. <laughs> Thank <laughs> <One>. you. <laughs> well, just once, don't, don't skip blind, but. <laughs>